Um, kind of going to give an overview of how our project, our ballooning, balloon work kind of got started, what we've done in the past, um, and kind of where we want to take it in, into the future. Um, way back when, in the late 1990s, uh, is when we first got involved in this. And in the Space Studies Department, uh, it was uh, the Space Mission Design course, which Dr. Fevig talked about earlier. Um, actually, a fellow by the name of John Graham taught it back then, but uh, we still had kind of the same issues, the same problems to deal with, and that was how do we teach uh, college-age students uh, concepts involved in designing, uh, constructing, operating uh, spacecraft and space systems. A uh, list of some of the uh, subsystems and different things like that uh, that we go through there. Well, if you have access to space, in theory, anyway, it's uh, kind of simple, right? You just design a mission, you build a spacecraft, and you launch it, and you know, go on your merry way. Um, of course, that's a little bit problematic for most people uh, because, well, if you you know, building the the spacecraft itself might not be a, uh, an enormous task, at least if you look at it in the overall um, structure of the thing. Trying to get that spacecraft then to orbit. Uh, is. In fact, it's usually a really expensive proposition. Uh, Dr. Fevig can uh, talk to you, attest to that uh, certainly as well from some of the other work that he's done. Um, so, if, and if you can actually get the spacecraft to orbit and it survives that trip to orbit and it's working, well then you actually have to operate it. So we have recurring costs uh, in terms of ground control. Uh, if you have a spacecraft up there and, you know, you get your mission done and stuff like that and the spacecraft still works, funding agencies kind of like you to wring every last little bit of functionality out of that spacecraft uh, just because it was such an uh, expensive proposition to put it up there. One of the other problems that we run into uh, with modern space missions, too, is the timelines. Um, it takes typically a long time to go from a mission concept to actually having a spacecraft on orbit, right? And this amount of time, well, if you have students in the project initially, they might never get to see that spacecraft launched. And if you get st other students into the uh, project later on, well, they might operate the spacecraft, but they didn't get the experience of actually putting the thing together. So you have like a disparity in terms of the education that the students get. Um, so it's kind of, kind of suboptimal. Um, and another thing is regularity of access. If you're trying to teach this course every semester, or even every year, or even every couple years like that, um, most people just don't have the amount of money that it would take to launch a spacecraft every two years, unless you're like good, close, personal friends with Bill Gates. Uh, so it's just kind of a non-starter for uh, a lot of uh, programs. So how, how do we handle this? Well, the easiest thing to do probably is to design what we call paper spacecraft. Basically, it's a design-only approach. You design the spacecraft, you come up with basically a set of documents. Um, this is good for the high-level concepts, especially people who have never actually designed spacecraft before. They kind of get a feel for what's the basics that goes into a system and how it operates and things like that. Uh, and this is also obviously the first step that you would take if you're going to carry this further. And the advantage to this is that it has very low cost. Of course, the drawback to it, some people consider this to be too academic, too um, uh, abstract, basically. You're exposing the students what they, uh, to the design process, but you're not exposing them to a lot of real world stuff that they'll run into as engineers or even scientists. Uh, things like uh, debugging systems, because systems never work the way that uh, they, they look on paper. Um, system interactions, you can have two subsystems that work great on the bench and you connect them to a common power supply and all hell breaks loose. Uh, assembly problems. I was involved in a project once where a student had built a, or designed a gas sampler and it was just a beautiful design. It had all these tanks and plumbing fitting in and all that kind of stuff in there and it looked like dynamite. And then when he tried to build it, he found out he couldn't actually put it together. If you put all the tanks in there, there wasn't room to get your hands in there to plumb the things. And if you tried to plumb the tanks, you couldn't fit them into the racks that uh, the tanks went into. So you can design something that looks great on paper, but you can't actually build. Uh, thermal control, again, there's always gremlins, always devil in the details there, things that you don't uh, think about. And finally, the last one on this slide is component behavior versus uh, specifications. Uh, one engineer I know said there's three kinds of lies, lies, damned lies, and component specs. Um, as was mentioned yesterday, some things like maybe electrolytic capacitors, things like that, they'll still work if you get them very cold, put them in an extreme environment, but their values can change radically, and that can have quite an effect um, on how your system works. So having that sort of experience uh, is definitely a good thing. 
So with their paper spacecraft, the students don't get some of the most valuable real world experience. So what do we do to take it beyond that? Well, we can simulate spacecraft. A couple different ways to do that. We have software only simulations. There's some really good codes out there where you can uh, simulate just about everything that a spacecraft encounters in a space environment. Uh, you can develop the software codes you need to uh, have attitude control for it, thermal control, either, either active or passive, uh, power generation, communications, different things like that. Um, this goes a little bit beyond the design stage, obviously. It teaches a very important lesson that writing software, or writing good software is a non-trivial task. And maybe you can tell I teach computer science. This is something I harp on a little bit. Um, and it's also inexpensive in that you only basically need general purpose off-the-shelf computers to run simulations. Some of the drawbacks, similar to paper spacecraft, there's a level of abstraction there that you're, are you really dealing with something real or are you just dealing with the idea of it? Um, and again, it doesn't expose the students to actually trying to build something that works. So what uh, the next step would be hardware-based uh, simulated spacecraft where you actually build a spacecraft bus and have it you know, sit there and you test it and things like that. The students actually roll up their sleeves and build things and have to so learn how to solder, learn how to program, how to make things actually work. Um, and then you can take that spacecraft, or that simulated spacecraft, and expose it to simulated space environments like uh, vacuum or low temperatures, high temperatures. You can blast it with radiation, do all kinds of things that it might run into uh, in the space environment. Uh, the good thing about that, it's cheaper than launching. Most things are. Um, and it exposes the students to the real world uh, systems uh, and the bugs and stuff that we run into with those. Uh, there's less launch pressure with this. If you have a spacecraft or an experiment that's like riding on somebody else's rocket, if you're like a secondary payload or something like that, and you have a problem and your, uh, your hardware is delayed, well, the, the primary, if they're ready to go and there's 100 people, you know, in a very expensive rocket sitting there on the pad, they might not wait for you. Whereas if you're doing a simulated one, you can play with the schedule a little more. Uh, the cons, of course, the, still not in space. And if your spacecraft is uh, dealing with trying to take science data, well, you can't really do too well uh, in a simulated environment for that. So that leads us to the near space alternative. You guys are all familiar with this. Many of the same things that we run into in space, partial vacuum, cold temperatures. We have ionizing radiation. Um, we have blasting of uh, solar uh, ultraviolet rays, things like that. It's very inexpensive to access. Uh, certainly compared with rocketry, even sounding rockets, even amateur level rockets, um, the amount of money that it would cost to build one and have a fuel shot uh, for a single flight is about what you would uh, pay to launch a balloon. And you get a lot more hang time with a balloon. Uh, and it provides an environment where you can actually do scientific studies and different things that are listed there. So that brings us back to the University of North Dakota High Altitude Balloon Project. Uh, back in 1998, John Graham, uh, again, was teaching the uh, Space Mission Design course. I was helping him out with some various things like that. And we said, hey, maybe there's something to this balloon stuff. We should try this out. And John said, hey, that's a great idea. Let's get a pilot project together. One of the problems that we ran into at the time was nobody had any money for us. It was just like, well, we want to do this. Well, how does this work? Well, we don't really know. We've never done it before. It's like, well, is there anybody else you can work with? Well, not really uh, within a reasonable distance um, at the time. So we actually ended up uh, funding this pilot project out of our own pockets. Um, we didn't have any experience, so we figured the next thing we had to do was actually find somebody who did and see if we could pick their brain. So we got on the web, and we found that the Amateur Satellite Corporation used to do balloon work, but they kind of got out of that business. They're too busy with their spacecraft now. But we did uh, finally find the Edge of Space Sciences website. Um, and these guys were great. I mean, they had like written a handbook that they put on their website, had all these details dealing with like federal regulations and uh, filling procedures and different things like that. So I said, we'll, we'll use that as our uh, uh, kind of our model here. Uh, we put together a team of student volunteers. Uh, luckily, we had a group of students that were very interested in this uh, concept. Uh, we got them from the physics department, uh, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, uh, space studies different things like that. This was their first experience with this sort of thing. Uh, so there was a lot to learn, uh, especially with the federal regulations, the last thing there. Your first time reading the FAR 101s usually is an interesting experience for just about everybody. It's just like, what the heck are they talking about? Is this even English? What, what do they mean? Uh, we were also very lucky 
in Grand Forks that we had a, a group of radio amateurs who expressed a strong interest in this as well. Um, not only did they bring a lot of experience with radio communications and electronics to the table, but these guys loved fox hunting. If anybody hasn't heard of fox hunting, it's a game where you try to find a, a hidden radio transmitter. And these guys just live for this, and they thought the idea of trying to go out there and find a balloon that was with, you know, somewhere, could be anywhere, uh, that had a transmitter on it, well, that was pretty cool with them. And they had all the gear and stuff like that, they were ready to go. So, we, this, uh, at this point, we actually had to put something together and launch. That's kind of scary. And John Graham very uh, wisely said, you know, let's keep our uh, mission objectives realistic here. Let's go with little baby steps. First, we'll try to just build the thing. And if we can launch it and track it, we'll call that good. If we can get it back, that would be awesome. But we're not going to make that a requirement for the first flight because that's probably biting off too much. Um, so we threw together a payload. Uh, basically, it just had a two meter radio transmitter, basic stamp computer, which would uh, key an audio tone um, on the transmitter so that we could, uh, the, the fans could track it. Uh, we put a film camera on there and a rud very rudimentary uh, dust collector experiment that one of our people had designed, and then threw uh, some batteries in it and a parachute. Uh, we did actually manage to launch this thing. Learned quite a bit about uh, ground system equipment, or GSE, and uh, launch procedures during that. Uh, mostly about how not to do things, but uh, we still actually uh, were able to launch it into a clear blue sky, which had a single cloud in it, and the balloon went right for the cloud. And it went into the cloud, and the radio went dead. So it's just like, oh, well, that's not so good. And what had happened was the internal battery ran out of power. We hadn't tested things. Uh, we never actually recovered this. We did put a sign on it saying, you know, contact information and stuff, but I don't know if it ended up in the front end of somebody's harvester or something like that, but we never got a call. But it was, however, considered a valid proof of concept, so we were uh, offered some additional funding, and uh, we were off uh, to the races at that point. Uh, over the course of the next 12 years, uh, we kind of dialed in our game. We had uh, over 40 flights. Uh, we had, uh, have a better than 90% recovery ratio, uh, which is not bad. Some of the ones that we have lost, we've had like only single tracking systems on, different things like that. And, uh, it just, you guys know how that the stuff just isn't perfect. Uh, when we switched to the APRS, Automatic Position Reporting System, this took a lot of the drudge work and the, the voodoo out of uh, trying to find these things. That really helped a lot. Uh, we didn't have the nice little super lightweight uh, APRS stuff that they have now for ballooning. We had this big honking Mike E unit that was made to go in a truck that was all, you know, heavy metal uh, chassis and all that kind of stuff. So. Um, and we also refilled our, or refined our filling and launch techniques, uh, learned how to properly measure the amount of uh, lift at the nozzle and uh, come up with better regulators and things so we could uh, fill our balloons in a reasonable uh, amount of time. Some of the payloads we've launched over the years, film cameras, we've done radio propagation or repeating, video cameras, uh, a whole bunch of stuff uh, that you see there. We actually launched a model rocket off of one of our things. We didn't tell the FAA about that till later. Um, but uh, yeah. Um, and then the students, some of the students involved actually had their own payloads that they developed completely uh, separate. Now, some of the other ones that you saw, it was kind of a collaboration between the faculty, uh, staff, some of the ham radio people, and the students building things. But these, some of these things the students built uh, completely on their own. They built uh, and flew temperature loggers, uh, uh, let's see, Geiger counters. Uh, some of them built their own cutdown mechanisms, and one of them actually homebrewed his own flight computer, uh, which was pretty impressive and worked fairly well. Uh, we also partnered up with the uh, UND School of Engineering at one point. They had a microsatellite bus that they had built and tested and all this kind of stuff, and they were trying desperately to get a launch with. But they couldn't come up with anybody who could uh, give them a ride for the amount of money that they had. So I said, hey, would you fly this on one of your balloons? Uh, just kind of, you know, as the, uh, the capstone to the uh, course for them. And we said, sure, we'll do that. So we did. Some of the faculty actually involved, got involved as well with uh, their research. Uh, Blaise Maybeck of the UND uh, Energy Environmental Research uh, Center flew some atomic mercury traps. He was working on a project to measure upper air atomic mercury coming out of like coal-fired power plants and things like that. Um, and Dr. Vadim Rigolov of UND Space Studies actually provided some uh, biological pay uh, payloads, uh, the little plantlets that uh, Dr. Fevig was talking about the other day that we flew and returned and one of them actually lived. Now, a lot of this work that we did, we, we were tremendously productive around 2002, 2003, thing there. In fact, we were all, almost working so much that people were getting burned out. 
Some of the hams are like, well, you know, this isn't all that much fun anymore. Um, it's kind of getting to be like a job. Uh, and we're also kind of like, well, we've done all these different things. What are we doing? Why are we doing this in the first place? We kind of sat down and said, okay, it's fun and all, but what are we trying to accomplish here? Um, are we trying to be a launch service provider that the students bring their stuff to them and then we just fly it? Or are we trying to be like faculty mentors where we provide an environment where the students can do more of the, of the work themselves and uh, kind of guide them and uh, hopefully increase their odds of success? So we are looking at uh, the different roles of faculty and staff and students. Around this point, uh, John Graham actually left UND to pursue other interests and uh, we kind of hit a, a rough spot and kind of stalled out for a while. We didn't do too many flights um, for a number of years. But then Dr. Fevig came to the Space Studies Department and said, hey, you guys have a balloon group here. And I said, yes, we do, actually. And I said, well, we got to get that running again and, you know, we can incorporate this. So I said, okay, well, that's great. But one of the things we really need to do, though, is to kind of rethink how we run this thing. And what we wanted to do is to put, a, put it into more of a formal systems engineering approach, basically change the way that we manage the project. Because as you all know, project management, especially when you have a big team of students or even you know, any sort of people trying to build stuff and fly stuff on uh, deadlines is a non-trivial problem. Um, and we also wanted to work more closely with the engineering department. And we actually figured that this would be a good fit with inclusion into the uh, senior projects um, classes that engineering runs. So that means more meetings, more milestones, we have deliverables, we have fixed dates, but guess what? We actually had less chaos and frustration with all the people involved. We were actually getting more stuff done. So uh, that, uh, it seems to uh, be working pretty well for us. And we're saying, okay, now it's probably more appropriate for us, for the faculty, um, to take on more of a mentoring role and let the students kind of do the heavy lifting, not just because it's a lot of work and we're lazy, but um, because they actually tend to learn more that way they take away better life lessons from that rather than just watching somebody else do it. Some of the challenges, of course, life is not a basket of kittens all the time. Um, trying to keep a core group with the skills and experience necessary to do this is a challenge. Um, the thing with students is we get good students and then we train them how to do these things and they get really good at it and then they graduate and they leave and they take you know, high paying jobs somewhere else and we have to start all over again. I mean, we, we gotta find a way to put a stop to this, Ron. You know, that's just, um, funding, of course, uh, Space Grant has been a godsend. I mean, th they've been tremendously helpful. The program wouldn't exist without them. Um, but we're always, of course, looking for more funding opportunities. There's always more gear, different things like that we could use. And then, finally, the normal uh, launch schedules and opportunities that we run into. Uh, the North Dakota climate. In North Dakota, we have winter. Rather a lot of it. Probably more than anybody really has a right to expect. Um, I know the manly man of NASA go out and launch in, in uh, Antarctica. We don't like being outside when it's 20 below and windy. So saying there are limited opportunities that we can uh, launch in. Um, basically the, the weather, of course, and in the summer when we have our launch opportunities, uh, the student availability is, is an issue and sometimes launch sites. Uh, the insurance, the I word, yes. Um, as a university, we actually have a policy that covers this uh, fairly well. But, I mean, we have, um, our maximum liability insurance I just found is out is like a million dollars. Um, that sounds like a lot of money, but if you run a six pound payload through somebody's General Electric turbofan engine, it might not be that much. So, so one of the things that we're investigating further is do we need any additional uh, insurance for what we do and what are the risks. Uh, some of the future work we want to do, blending unmanned aerial vehicle and balloon technologies. We're doing a lot of UAV work up at UND. One of the things I saw, there's an Australian company that makes a little UAV that's lofted by a balloon and then it cuts down and it tries to like fly back to uh, where you launch from. It sounds like a really neat idea. From a technical standpoint, I bet we could do that. Uh, from a regulatory standpoint, uh-uh, FAA would never buy that. Um, but, you know, we dream big. Um, obstacle avoidance, uh, Crystal's work that she talked about, uh, trying to have the payload not fall in things like lakes, forests, or populated areas would be a good thing. Um, if we can have some type of control for the descent to avoid that, uh, that's something we should look at. And ADSB, anybody in here who not know what ADSB is? Okay, uh, ADSB is the cornerstone of the next generation air traffic control system. It's basically APRS for airplanes. Think about it that way. Um, the FAA would love to see ADSB transponders on all UAVs out there. So they're working on trying to make really lightweight little ones so that uh, anything that's flying up there with an ADSB transponder 
the pilot, you know, in the Northwest DC-9 has his display that's got his aircraft and then all the ADS-B aircraft equipped around him showing up on that. And so does the ATC Center down at Minneapolis, things like that. If we can leverage some of this work that's being done by companies to make small, lightweight ADS-B transceivers, that might really make us some friends in the FAA. So I think that's something that uh, can have some legs to it. Uh, and finally, a modular bus system. Um, that's always, of course, the holy grail. We'll make just the standard kit that will work all the time. That's kind of like trying to come up with the perfect cell phone. Every time you come up with a design, the user's like, no, no, it's got to have this, and it doesn't have my favorite feature, that, and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, we would like to uh, develop that if we could, but uh, yeah, it's, it's probably going to be uh, something that continues on. But anyway, questions? <laughs> 